It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things, and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again. Time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 302. Tonight I'm joined by Emmo. Hello. Ashgar. Hi. Grace. Hello. Kodra. Hi. And Tam. Hello. So what the audience isn't going to be aware of is it took me an exceptionally long time to get started. Reason being, I lost a hard drive this week. And guess where TeamSpeak was trying to point at? Uh Uh-oh. That hard drive. So I had to wait for it to, I guess, time out and prompt me to choose a new place. Spinning disk hard drive? Spinning disk hard drive, yeah. One of my large storage drives. Um, I, in theory, got most of the stuff off of it, but then realized that half of the images in one of my directory won't open anymore after moving them off. So, yeah, fun times. Which has made me actually like kind of start looking into cloud backup solutions that are affordable. Um, just so I don't have to care. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, thankfully, like I store all of our raw data for the podcast on a network attached storage. It's got some redundancy built in. But um, okay, so Dungeon Defenders? Dungeon Defenders Awakened, a okay. remake of the original game. Okay came out this week. And how is it? It is a remake of the original game. It really is a remake of the original game. So, I never played Dungeon Defenders 2. Can you synopsize why everyone thought it was terrible? It was a free-to-play bullshit mess. Oh, okay. That makes sense, actually. So, I I can't even tell you if the gameplay was good, because I didn't get to experience any of it meaningfully. Got it. Well, like... It was one of those things where I loved the original Dungeon Defenders and, like, I kind of wanted to see some new ideas at play here. But whatever. Like, remastered graphics and, you know, new cutscenes, I guess. It's very (laughs) pretty. And Dungeon Defenders is super fun. It's still a fun game to play. I was expecting it to be a little bit more different than it is, because currently it is not different. I don't know if we got farther it would become different. Well, so there were some interesting modes there that I don't know that if those modes existed in the original game. Things like the various challenges. The various challenges, the like, the no towers, the no fighting. Yeah. Yeah. There's some different things that were available that I did not uh, I did not notice. The first game had a character who was intended to just sort of guide things and not actually fight. But it's interesting to see them apply that to just a mode that you could put everyone in. Yeah. Are the graphics really that much improved? I, you know what? I assume so because they look like I imagined they did when I played it the last time. The answer is yes. Fair. Like, Dungeon Defenders 1 is not the prettiest game in the world anymore. It's fair. Just I, sort of I just don't really, really remember it, honestly. Like, I don't remember what it looks like. It looks like WoW. It was super cartoony. I mean, this is still super cartoony, though. I mean, it's good. it was good. I really enjoyed the original. Um, but the thing that I feel like is... Uh, not tremendously clear to me is like, why wouldn't I just play the original that has like tons and tons of extra stuff? But if it looks better and like controls better and stuff, like that's fine. Yeah, at this point, it feels not quite like going backward because some systems have definitely been tightened up for the new one. Yeah. But it's missing like everything they added after release for the new, for the original. Like the robot character, the jester, although the jester was a terrible idea and nobody should play it but also the uh, Summoner and the Barbarian, as well as the alternate versions of the original glasses. Yeah. I mean, is the thought process that they'll sell it as DLC? I have no idea. Seems likely. I mean, if there had, if there had been deals, like good DLC, I would be into it. Um, I actually, and, and honestly, I'm still into it. It's still a good game, but I feel like I, I, I'm sort of with, uh, with Coder on this one, and I'm sort of surprised that there wasn't like 
more going on. I mean, I'm with you there. I mean, it kind of sounds like this would be what would normally be just an HD remaster. Yeah. It basically is that if they didn't include any of the DLC in said remaster. Right. That's it's that thing. But 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 therein is the problem, because usually when you have like an HD remaster, it's like all of the things from the previous one with Definitive. better graphics. Yeah, right. like like game of the year edition type thing. Right. And I think that if it were that, I would have I would be like, oh, yeah, I'm tr- tremendously excited about this. This is great. So it's still fun to play, but I'm only a little excited about it rather than extremely excited. Right. Exactly. It's still it's still fun to play. And I do I do think that it. It has more interesting levels right off the bat because that is one it's thing. It's true. That I, they do. Well, then, they don't put you through like five different levels in the cave before you get to get out of the cave. They just took like the best of each area. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this does seem like a weird thing other than maybe they needed funding for whatever is going to be the next game. I mean, I, mean, I imagine this was expensive to make. It looks really? expensive. It makes me wonder if you... Go back several years to the original plans for Dungeon Defenders 2. Uh, they were going to make a MOBA. Yikes. Yeah. And then when it came out, they decided MOBAs were not a good thing to be in at the moment. They were definitely in the you are too late part of the curve. Yep. I mean, they're they're kind of like, that's what Dungeon Defenders feels like is a, a PvE MOBA in a lot of ways. So I can see the like desire there. Uh huh. They had to scrap that idea before Dungeon Defenders Two actually came out, and what came out was not some, not something anyone was apparently happy with. So is this like assets sitting on the cutting room floor, then reused into a new game? Or uh, I've seen this game at PAX twice. I think they just wanted they wanted to get people to trust them again after Dungeon Defenders Two, so they made this. Admittedly, kind of important. Yeah. Yeah. True. But my fear is that if if it's basically just Dungeon Defenders 1 minus a bunch of content, is it going to feel like I've been there, done that, but not like a, the full experience? It definitely feels like that to me. Yeah. And admittedly, it's been what? How many years since we played this last? Eight not or so. Even, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, cool, I'll replay this thing, but slightly cleaned up almost a decade later for fun. But like... Did we really play Dungeon Defenders last before we started podcasting? Yes. Yes. Oh, man. I thought it was more recent than that. No, it is. It, I was it still is in college. Game. Yeah. Wow. I can't, wait, this, 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 this math is not. No, that is right. Oh, no. Oh, I'm <laughs> old, aren't I? Oh, oh. <laughs> My my sweet summer child, <laughs> you you are only you have yet to know the depths of oh I'm old. <laughs> no comment. Yeah, though, like I I mean I think y'all were playing it around the same time as uh, what's the game where the bad ideas game where you're playing a bunch of wizards, Magica. Uh, Magica. Yeah, yeah, we tried Magica and it was mostly Magica's a disaster. A unsatisfying. It was what? Magica is a little unsatisfying. Yeah. Too much emphasis on friendly fire, quite frankly. Yes. And too difficult for how heavy on the friendly fire it is. I kind of want to play Nine Parchments again, because that seems like Magicka, but not that. Nine Parchments, however, is only really couch co-op, so maybe later. I mean, I guess I wish them luck. And honestly, like, it's entirely possible that they go off in some different directions with DLC and make some significant changes, which would be fine. Yeah. They don't need to remake the Jester, as I alluded to earlier. Right. Like, their DLC was kind of hit hit or miss. They can totally be... They can totally go in some different directions with that, and it'll be fine. What's the uh, price tag like for this trip down memory lane? Uh, I think, I think the base price is 30 bucks currently with a small discount, small launch discount. I mean, that's not bad. I mean, I mean, I've spent more on getting a prettier version of a game I already owned. So and in, it's still fun. In the uh, same vein of dungeon crawling games, I uh, have spent the last couple weeks playing Minecraft Dungeons. Um, I initially played it on Xbox and Windows through Game Pass, 
and it was enjoyable enough that I went ahead and picked it up on the Switch just because it seemed like the kind of game I would prefer to play from bed. Um, I don't have real favorable views of this game now. Um, so first of all, it is Minecraft without mining or crafting. Oh, okay. Um, it is it is a Minecraft graphics looking uh, isometric sort of dungeon crawl game, but like really, it feels a lot more like Gauntlet Legends or Gauntlet Dark Legacy than like a Diablo type game. Did you play the more recent Gauntlet? I did. I did. And it it feels less like that and more like the original, like Legends. Oh, I'm not uh, entirely you... sure that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, like it's it feels dated, honestly. But I liked Legends at the time. Um, the The core problem is it feels kind of unfinished. Um, like it's got a really good shell, and it is enjoyable for the first few little areas. Um, but so the, so the central conceit is that you know these illagers have run amok in the countryside, and you have to protect the good villagers from them. And villagers, illagers, villagers. Yes. yes, which is kind of dumb. I mean, but it's 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 a simple thing that you know kids can understand. I guess I don't know. I mean, I feel like you're selling kids short, but like, whatever. It's <laughs> Minecraft has never had a story, um, and they're trying to make it a story. Um, so, one of the first things but, that you do. What about Minecraft Story Mode? I mean, that was written by a, a company that is not Mojang. By Telltale. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, like, I, I don't know if I honestly don't know if these crossover at all. Um, so first strike against it is you are given a bunch of preset characters um theory probably being that they can at some point sell you more preset characters to play as um but i so i I found a character that i was fine with It, it wouldn't have been what i chose and i went off adventuring into the world and the first little area is you seizing this camp that's going to serve as your base of operations. And my thought is, okay, well, this camp is going to evolve over time, which is sort of true, but only for a little bit. The camp gets a blacksmith and then five or so missions later gets a traveling salesperson. And that gives you access to spend these emeralds that you're getting through the, the zones on total random grabs of equipment. Um, So the blacksmith makes weapons and armor. um, That's just total random crapshoot. You're spending some, some money and getting a thing out the other end. And the traveling salesperson gets, gives you artifacts. And in theory, artifacts are these items you equip that do something. The problem is most of them aren't useful. Um, the only real useful artifact I was able to find is a thing that collects souls over time while you're killing these waves of creatures. And then you can use some of those souls as basically an extra heal potion. Um, the, the problem is like, it's fine for the first little bit and it's kind of enjoyable. I mean, it's a, it's a low key, dungeon crawling game um the gear isn't near plentiful enough um it's not interesting in any way there's no real build options um your gear has the ability for you to enchant it however the stat that is increased when you enchant it is totally random so some of those are useful others of those are not useful at all um the problem that I ran into was the it doesn't feel balanced at all. Um, you will have certain mob types that you can mow through like they're not even standing there. And then you have ones that will come from out of nowhere and one shot you that you can't even see them on the, the edge of the screen. Um, there's a lot of caster type mobs. And they can attack you at least one full screen away, well out of your visual distance. 
So you're just kind of walking along, and then all of a sudden, um, there's this one that like puts up stone pillars um, and can also put up pillars that explode. And the problem with that is, like, say you may get swarmed by a bunch of of zombies. Um, From out of nowhere, this person will put a ring of stone pillars around you, trapping you with everything that's attacking you, and you really have no way to get away, and you're just dead. So Um, is... Is this um, is this actually using like Minecraft combat? No, no, no. It's like like this. This game essentially could be any other thing. Minecraft is just a theme for the game. Like so, you're, you're still fighting, like click you're to fighting moving? zombies. What click to move? Um, no. Well, I mean, like I'm playing on the Switch, so it's it's move with your joystick and swing a weapon type thing. Um, I played it with a controller on the PC as well. I don't know what the mouse and keyboard controls are, but I have a feeling it's probably WASD based on the way the other two control. Um, you you have a dodge mechanic, but like it's it's one of those you can dodge and then it takes a little bit to recover and then you can dodge again. Mm-hmm. So you can't really roll multiple times to get away from something, or at least not real successfully. Um yeah, so like the the problem that I had is that it's very uneven in the difficulty. And it's not so much that things are difficult, it's just they're really cheap that they can just straight up one shot you. Uh, um and you get three tries to make it through a level. You basically have three three reses um in order to get through a level. Um and I don't know, like, the the entire package just isn't really fun. Like, so there's no interesting gear. There's no real build options, which is a thing that, like, you usually rely on to for making a character that feels like you want to play it in an ARPG. Um, And, yeah, I mean, like, it's it's a Minecraft-themed mess. It it does not succeed at being Diablo, and it does not succeed at being any of the other... Well, it doesn't succeed at being Minecraft, so... But apparently kids are liking it, so I, I posted my, my review, and one of my parent friends said that their kid really liked it, and then two days later that the kid was wanting them to try and help them get past something. So I'm guessing they hit that wall where the difficulty level just kind of spikes for no apparent reason. And the difficulty level spiking wouldn't be that big of a deal if the gear was improving as well. But I'm not getting any gear improvements. I'm just getting one shot more often. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, so it is not good. I would not suggest it. Um, I mean, if you've got Xbox Games Pass, try it out. However, play it a lot longer than I did. Because, <laughs> like, the first couple areas are kind of fun. But it doesn't get any better. It it just kind of gets worse. Okay, Kodra, this one is yours. Uh, PSO and its l- frustrating divergence of good tutorial and bad tutorials. Yes, yeah. So, uh, PSO two has all of these great tutorials for how to play various classes. Uh, how to find those is not well breadcrumbed, I would say. But there are quests that you can get where you get to try out all of the various classes and they try and demonstrate to you, here is how you should play the class, here's what the class specializes at, and tries to push you to understanding, like, what am I signing up for when I'm going to play this class? I think they're pretty good. The one for Bouncer was really fun. Um the fact that I did that and then didn't get any of the like core pieces I needed to be able to play bouncer was a little frustrating, but whatever, like you're going to, what do you mean by that? One of the things they mentioned in bouncer is I needed a bunch of elemental spells that I never got. Ah, and I finally gotten them, but yeah, it's just one of those things that, uh, I, I, I finally got in them, and I kind of want to go back and remind myself how to play. You can keep doing them. They're really good ways of learning how to play a given class. 
everything else in this game is the tutorial for it feels terrible. It is it is definitely a it is a game from a from a particular era of game there's a particular era of games where it was it was considered a feature for the game not to explain itself and for players to have to figure them out pve there's a there's like a a bunch of pve multiplayer games from a certain like late 2000s early 2010s where it was like oh the way we're gonna make a pve multiplayer game hard is by obscuring all of our systems and making players work together as a community to figure them out but Um, in basically every case where that occurred uh there's some article on the internet goes this is how everything works yes um yeah yeah this is not used very much any longer for that reason I mean, uh, there's a lot of source material for this game. The problem is, is this game has too Japanese much source version. material. Like, like the it's all from the Japanese version, which isn't a hundred percent relevant to us on the North American version. One of the things, like a great example of this, um, actually came out of last week's podcast. I believe Phelan was talking about gathering, and several of us, I think it was both Bell and I, were like, "There's gathering in this game." And yes, there is, and it's apparently quite important, and you're going to either find it or you're not. So, a thing that I keep trying to emphasize is that the ARCS quests, the ARCS main quests, attempt to direct you to everything that is important in this game. Yes. They do direct you to the cafe, they do direct you to the practice quests. Yeah, there's a a particular mechanic, but it's buried. It is buried. (laughs) They bury it in menus, and I don't really understand why. But if you do everything in there, it walks you through, like, here's everything you should know about this game. Yeah, and and the challenge is, like, the thing I did is I just started running expeditions. I I, I ignored all the, the client orders initially. Yep. I just started running expeditions, because, like, that's how you played PSO1. Yeah. And um, the game will absolutely cheerfully let you do that thing. Yes, It'll let you ignore everything in the game. <laughs> yes. It it forces you to do it forces you to do one thing, but it opens all of the menus for you. So you never really get a sense of where it is. Um it does one thing that I think that even though the the Arcs missions do a pretty good job of um like pointing out all of the things you should know, I think one of the things that they're not good at is giving you relevant information when it's relevant to you. Yes. So it just gives you, like, before before level 10, you can know all of this stuff about enhancing weapon. You can, like, do the quests to enhance weapons and stuff, but, like, that's not, it's not important yet. It's not important yet. And so you're going to forget. And so, like, I wish I could redo the mission that's like, hey, hey here's what you should know about, um, here's what you should know about uh, augment, or is like, augment... Not enhancing, but the game does not weapons. walk you through augments until you hit level seventy. Yeah, and as a result, I'm like, I have a weapon that I feel like augments are relevant for, but I but I don't really follow it, and like it means that I don't really have a good way of looking at. Oh, hey, I've gotten a whole bunch of loot, but none of it is a direct upgrade. So what do I do with it? And the honestly, answer, I don't think you have a weapon that is worth augmenting. Right. But I have a weapon that might, but I have no way of, but that's the thing is I have no way of knowing if I have a weapon that's worth augmenting. That's true. Um, Because the game suggests to me that every weapon is worth augmenting, which is fundamentally untrue. But, but like, I don't have a weapon that's worth augmenting. It kind of suggests the opposite. Like, they don't give you a tutorial that mentions augments in any way until you're level 70. Well, in the enhancement thing, they talk about augmenting. Don't you also get a number of... um... Okay, maybe I don't know what augmenting is. Isn't that what I'm using grind- getting grinders for? No. No. Okay. There's enhancement and there's augments. Enhancing is like raising the level of your weapon. Augments then- are all those little extra abilities that weapons have. Yeah. Uh-huh. You can customize that. Okay. Uh, it is a very expensive process. I, I just feel like 
enhancements and augments is one of those things where I feel like we are overloading some terms a little bit. Too okay, so, so that gets into one of the core problems that I've had is the game will tell you to do a thing and use some words, uh-huh. but the words are never explained. And in a lot of cases, there are things that mentally to me seem like, well, that's probably that thing. But no, that's not that at all. And, you know, like they, they're, okay, so the enhancement and augment, those are cinema, si, si, <laughs> sim and, God. Synonyms. Synonyms, yes. I don't know why I can't say that tonight. Um, but, like, they're basically the same. Like, to me, like, okay, I'm augmenting a weapon or I'm enhancing a weapon. They're, they're, they're the same thing. But in this game, they're very different things. Yeah, there's definitely a... Um, it's come up a few times, but there's definitely a certain amount of uh, translation is not localization. <sighs> Honestly, I am annoyed extremely when they did a worse job than the fan translation, which they did in some areas. Wow. The, the fan translation you guys were playing with back when you did that silly experiment? Yeah, yes. back when you were doing that yes. thing three years ago or whatever. Yeah, in theory, it was a better translation on a lot of the points. Not this one, though. I, I also find it funny. We were getting into this game right right before podcast. Uh, Bell was talking about how the casino was a ripoff because he had just like lost a bunch of money at Masetta Shooter and uh, was complaining that the bombs hit him and we're taking a bunch of money and I was like oh well yeah I have a bunch of bombs show up too but you can just dodge them he's like how do you dodge oh you can just move your ship left and right it does not tell you that and it's not obvious I didn't know it was a ship I just thought it was like a a a cannon or something that was sitting there that you were firing I did this exact same thing through the first two rounds of that when I was in there and it's like it would have I, maybe there is a like little control synopsis somewhere in the very cluttered UI that this game presents you with that could have told you you could have moved your ship left or right. I don't actually know. This game's UI feels oppressive to me. The game's honestly... UI is really re- reminiscent of the Final Fantasy Eleven UI. Yeah, interestingly, like I actually don't mind the in-game UI for the most part, what I find overwhelming are the menus. Mm-hmm. I think that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, that that's mostly what I'm saying when I say UI. Because everything is menu-driven, and the menus are not... I mean, they make sense if you know exactly what it is, but it is not specific enough for me to remember which of the hundred menus I have access to is the one I actually want for a specific thing. Like I can navigate this game mostly through rote memorization. And I'm slowly getting better at remembering, like I'm just getting used to where things are. And once you're used to it, it's like, okay, I know I need to go here. I know I need to go to the second option in the, the second option on the third thing from the right. That's where right. I need to go. You're just memorizing the location of things like I am. Okay, today I learned that the various people in bunny costumes around the casino will tell you how to play each of the games. I didn't know this until literally just now. I did not oh. know that. I guess it's because I no longer talk to every NPC. They don't look like NPCs that have anything important to say to you. Right, it just looks like the, the random stand And the guy who gives client orders at the, near the start of the casino doesn't tell you these things. Oh. <laughs> Are client orders quests you can do inside of the casino? Yes. Okay. There are client orders for playing the casino games. I, I that thought that was just sense. a repeat of the normal client order list. Uh Because that yeah. also exists in there, because I found that in PC. There's a normal quest counter. Yeah, there's a normal quest counter in here, but the client orders are unique from that guy. The other one is in the world, being able to identify what thing I'm supposed to be killing to complete a quest is uh, a challenge for me because 
There's a tiny little box in the upper left of my screen that has their name in tiny font, and that's the only way I can tell what I'm actually fighting. Have you resized the UI? I have not. Oh, Should God. I? Yes. Yes. Oh, God, immediately. All right. That's going to make also... that UI instantly more usable. Okay. So I also don't know about this. Where? What, what is this? The launcher. The launcher has it. Of course the, it does. Uh, I don't use the launcher. Yeah, but uh, the uh, Arc, Arc Slayer launcher also has it. Oh, my God. But, yeah. The default UI scale is not well suited towards 1080p or bigger screens. Yep. Which, you know, I I understand that. Like, I mean, sure, this game is eight years old. But even right. so... Well, I mean, the base resolution of this game is 720p. Right. That's that's what it starts at. That's what it's expecting to run at. The fact that it will run 4K is probably just miraculous. Worse, though, this UI scale only goes up to 1.5, which is good for 1080p, less good for 4K. But you can edit it in the text file. <sighs> yeah, that's, that's reasonable. <laughs> like, and I don't want it... Okay, so here's the, here's the thing, is I don't want it to sound like, oh my god... This game is so horrible. It's I like the game a lot. Oh, the game's, it's got the, some real old quirks. Yeah, the game like, is very fun. It's like, it's it's good enough to make me put up with this. Like that should say something. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, like all of the parts that I am doing where I'm actually doing a mission are great. Every time I'm in the uh the base ship, I'm like all right, now what chores do I have to do so I can go do the mission, the next mission? Which part of it is why I didn't do a lot of these quests is because it feels like I'm having to do wizard chores on the ship constantly. But if it allows me to just go out into the world, I just want to go out into the world and kill stuff. But there's a lot of reason to do these quests. I uh, spent the day with Pizza Maid. Um, She was streaming for... I had several hours and uh, I hopped into discord and ran stuff with, with her and some of the, the folks in their Alliance. And she is also a encyclopedia of knowledge about the game, but very specifically all of the weird cosmetic quirks of the game and <laughs> all of the housing system quirks. So sure, thing, that. Th- thing that I learned today Apparently, there is a loophole in the game. Um, by default, if you are a free-to-play player, you cannot trade with anyone. You can't sell things on the auction house. You can't, like, trade with me items. However, there is an item you can buy for fun, which is the free currency that is basically a gotchapon machine that you can put in your personal quarters. So... I knew that yeah. existed. I didn't know how it worked. You you load it up with items. <laughs> and then you can let your friends come in to buy those items. <laughs> and the cheapest you can put them for is a thousand Masetta. So what you do is you put a single item in the gachapon <laughs> and let your free-to-play friend come in and buy the one item for 1,000 Masetta. And it's this lovely loophole to get around trading between um, premium accounts and and freak accounts. So I, I bought one of those. So if anybody ever wants to use it, it is now in my personal quarters. Yeah, I mean, they, they apparently picked up a lot of this stuff from playing the Japanese game and also playing Xbox for the last X number of whatever. There's There's just so many systems. Like, so many systems. There are a lot. There are a lot of systems. I mean, it's nearly a decade of... Nearly a decade of systems. Yeah, I, this, it's a very you interesting thing. I just... I wonder if there's, like, a better way of being like, oh, it looks like you might not know how this game is played. Let's, like, try and drip-feed you systems better. They try. The arts missions are them trying. Okay. Yeah, but it, it's it's very much a it's very much still on me to decide the order which I consume the tutorials then, and I don't know which c- tutorials are relevant to me at which phase of the game I'm playing. Yeah, 
Also, is there something I can pay real money for to get more bag space? Yes. 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 I should look into that. I mean, if you actually quote unquote buy the game, you're going to get some bag space passes. <laughs> Not along really. With packs. So the Sonic pack comes with 50 inventory slots. The yeah, Dragon Memory pack does not. Okay. If you want the creepy-ass Sonic gear, you get bag space. Well, the Sonic gear contains more in-cash shop items than it costs. Some of those are character in- character storage expansions, which I do not think are terribly valuable. Unless you're just going to play one character, which is probably a horrible idea. I mean, it's okay. It's an idea? I mean, it's an idea. It's what I'd like to do, but... It's perfectly fine, as long as you're willing to shell out for more than one mag. And don't mind having the same appearance on everything you're playing. Yeah, that too. I have the perfect ex- appearance. <laughs> I mean, changing your appearance is also not terribly difficult. Well, I mean, sometimes I want, like, a different... I want it to be a different character, like the... the... Oh, I agree with you. Oh, yeah. As a concept, the character feels different to me. It's a big thing that I struggle with in FF14. Yeah, I, I understand that. I am I am much less of an alter. Like, I am a little allergic to alting. So I appreciate the option of having just a single character. Yeah. No, I'm super glad that it's there. Like, that part, totally. That, that said, you should make two more characters just, just for the next time the handouts go reset passes. Hmm. Is three characters the most you can have? For free, yes. So I was actually going to ask this. Uh, I was going to try and make a gunner, but that's not an option at the start. Is is that like expansion class? You just go to the... Yeah, it's an expansion class, and you can just go to the class trainer and switch to that class. Mm. Same is true of fighter and... Detector. Detector. The... When the game came out, it was just Hunter and Ranger and Force. And Tector, Fighter, and Gunner were added soon after. Then in Episode 2, Braver was added, and they also added the ability to start as Braver. Uh, Bouncer was Episode 3, Summoner was Episode 4. We don't have any Episode 4 content at all, but we have Summoner still, which I'm thankful for. But they never at any point went back and added the ability to start as Gunner, Tector, or um, Fighter. Is that true even in, like, the Japanese client still? Yep. Wild. But as soon as you get in game, you can switch to those classes. Or as soon as you've done the tutorial? You can skip the tutorial if it's not your first character. Oh. So that was the other thing that, like, got me thinking about this, is usually you take, like, the game's story and put some missions that are, depending on how successful you are, veiled tutorials... (laughs) <laughs> uh, but this game doesn't have story it does that's not true it does it's just you know how some people how occasionally you'll you'll run into somebody who's like man I wish I didn't have to play the story I just want to like do X that has you know I just want to do PvP or I just want to do dungeons I don't care about the story uh-huh. yes well this game rewards that you don't have to do the story at all ever but you should the rewards are great also the it story is... becomes good the story it's, inter- it's entertaining and it also unlocks a bunch of characters that you can run missions with. But I can I run missions run with mission you guys. With, yeah, I can just run missions with my friends. Yeah, but you get rewarded for running missions with the the characters from the story. Somewhat. You get a random item every so often. Yeah, but how will I start my missions out if I don't have Ash's ellipsis? Yeah. I do not regret setting that as an auto chat. <laughs> it's amazing. It's, it's the most Ash thing ever. It it very much is, and it, I don't I don't know if you guys don't have auto chat set, but it's it's always Ash that I see. Yeah, I don't have auto chat set. It's it's a very cool system, one of many systems that are very cool. <laughs> no, I complained about this story in this game a few weeks ago when I was when I had made it through episode one and was into episode two. Basically, I just complained about how episode one was. Oh, boy. That's the one I'm still on. Yeah, I'm not very will be for a while, because it is the one with the most, the greatest number of story missions, although not the longest missions, because they hadn't figured out how to tell a story yet. And they do figure that out? Well, you know how every so often we talk about the difference between better and good? 
Uh huh. Yes, that. I mean, there, there, there are interesting characters. However, you don't see much of them. Like you see them for very short periods of time. Like I've just now gotten to the point where the story is like the all of the individual vignettes that make up the story are coalescing into something approaching a plot. And like it's admittedly a fairly interesting plot, but it and it didn't take that much time to get there, in all honesty. It's just that the there's the interface for doing so is these tiny vignettes that say nothing. Yeah. For a long time. Like one of the vignettes that I watched, I went through a load screen and I had a f- dramatic fade in and camera pan over the course of about 20 seconds to a character that I had seen before looking for something who said what and then fade to black. E- and it was like, I'm not really a story. Like, it's the sort of thing that makes you think like you're somehow missing something. Or if you had, like, a comic book, but all it is is a bunch of establishing shots. Like, <laughs> over and over and over, just establishing shots. Nothing but that. <laughs> Eventually you can get the impression that Marlo hates hunters. Or she just says it. That's true. She's just like... Well, and, and that's sort of the thing, is it's like, it's difficult for me to tell what's what it's trying to tell me with the story, because... I, I keep having these like relatively pointless seeming vignettes um, where it's like where it's mostly just like they read kind of like parables. It's like, hey, this is a this is a dysfunctional mage who doesn't like tanks and doesn't like working with tanks because she's too hot headed and wants to stand on the front lines. And that's wrong. Like, but like, that's kind of a weird way to do things. It reminds me of the, in some ways it reminds me of like a less refined version of the FF14 white maid or conjurer storyline. The all I want to do is heal storyline. Yeah, the all I want to do is heal storyline and like the the game's message is no. I mean, and, and so far, like my favorite sequence has been Fourier. Fourier just wants to make friends with all the Lillipan. Yeah, exactly. Like she just wants to be friends with all the Lillipan. Yeah. Well, and I like her because I understand what's going on there more or less like, immediately. You, you know her motivation. You know what's going on. Yeah. And that's it. Like, you're just going to help her achieve that goal. Yeah. And then when you do so, it pays off. It's like, hey, we're set up, do a thing, pay off. Cool. I like that. And then there's everything with getting home where there is no payoff. Ugh. I mean, the eventual payoff is you get to beat him up, but I mean, that's... it takes too long to get to that. Yeah, well, I mean, you hate him instantly, and the rest of it is just watching him be an awful person, right? Particularly like, to his to partner. his partner, right? It's the worst. Like, but like that's a thing in in like anime. Like, I've seen that same dynamic play out numerous times oh, in anime. I mean, it's not just anime. Let's be clear. <laughs> It's definitely doing like that particular trope, and it's doing it as straight as I can tell. I just remember they the do an interesting thing with that later, but it's way later. Be prepared to see them play it straight for a very long time until then. It becomes a little bit more interesting when they start showing up on the ship as people you can talk to, because they will occasionally have different things to say that are not related to a specific story. Do I need to do story to unlock more client orders? Nope. No. Okay. Is there like a character level restriction on the story quest? Nope. Not oh. one bit. They're oh. mostly just vignettes. Well, there are solo missions, but they scale to your level. And they, if you're doing them on casual, they scale to your level up to a very, very low cap. Oh, okay. Right. But you're going to go through like 30 vignettes before you see a solo mission. Yes. <laughs> And noted. It's worth noting that these vignettes are like, I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I say they're like 30 seconds a piece in some cases. There's a lot of times it takes longer to load into the vignette than the vignette itself. Yeah. Like someone will come in from stage left or stage right, say a sentence, and then that's it. So episode one has, at least for the first part, roughly 20 vignettes per story mission. And those first several story missions are all single boss fights. Yeah. 
that sounds like it's a slog to get through. It Episode is. two is much better about this. Their average is probably about five. A lot of these are like one or two. There's a bunch of random stuff at the end, though. Yeah, it is definitely it is definitely a slog. Um, but it's not a slog that is for me. It's not a slog that is like time consuming. Weirdly enough, it's just like mental energy consuming. Because like I went through probably four story. I did I did four story missions today. And it only took like an hour and a half. Again, it gets better, but I think the storytelling in this game sucks. <laughs> That's not to say the story sucks, but the storytelling sucks. I I think it's very uh and, and that's sort of the thing. If you don't have, if you have a not optional story, your ability to figure out how to deliver tutorial is a little bit limited. Yeah, I mean tutorials. Tutorials are great. Like they're just an incredibly great mechanism for. Hey, here's what to expect from the game you're about to play. Here's some foundational knowledge to get you going, and. Also, here's some story delivery so that you can put context to the things you're doing. Because I think that I think that what what PSO isn't great at is giving you context for anything that's going on. Yeah. And it's fun enough that you don't really need it. You're like, all right, whatever. I'm just going to punch stuff. But it helps to have context because it's like I'm more invested. I'm more invested when I have some kind of context for why I'm doing a thing. Yeah. Like it's, I mean, as we talked about, as we talked about, about other games, like it is insufficient for me for a game to say, these guys just punch them, fight them, get loot. Like it's not really a enough of a motivation for me. Yeah. Well, the other thing, the initial tutorial does at least attempt to establish who you are and who you're fighting and why. Yeah. Well, I'm fighting against full spawn. But why am I fighting against everything else? And, like, if I'm doing expeditions, what am I doing the expeditions for? So that one, I mean, the opening cutscene and the tutorial do explain that. Like, Arx is an expedi- expeditionary force. You are looking, f- you are basically trying to uh, establish, if I remember correctly, establish contact with these planets and also fight fall spawn along the way. Yeah. And you do find out a little bit that the story where basically like fall spawn are corrupting these other races and you will actually meet draconians in the story that don't want to kill you. Yeah. Yeah. But they also don't trust your motivations. Right. Because don't understand that you're just trying to cleanse the fall spawn corruption. They think you're trying to kill what is effectively their God. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and I, I feel like the draconian stuff actually is, a, is some of the most interesting story because it's like, oh, this is why, this is why all of these guys are hostile when I run into them out in the world. But I also get the impression that more than likely, the Oceanids are probably going to be a similar story as the Draconids. More or less, they've been more of a mixed bag. It's like they kind of absolutely seem like also a organized group. I mean, the phantoms are just ghosts, so that's kind of clear. And the robots, I'm guessing, are just robots run amok? Basically, yeah. Other like than that there are still giant factories producing these things, and nobody knows why. Yeah, like you roll up on a planet, and there, uh, there's a ton of defensive robots, but nobody's really sure what they're doing there. I mean, they fight the Felspawn, but they also fight you, so it doesn't really help. Yeah. I mean, they're clearly we're told to protect, but they don't know what they're trying to protect against. Or they're not picky. (laughs) There is a several way later notes to try to explain what all the corruption on Lilipan actually is. Like episode three in later notes. Well, I don't know. Like there's a lot of interesting stuff going on, but there's also like a whole level of nonsense to get through it. But, I mean, to contrast, you know, one of my favorites, Destiny, it is at least all in-game. <laughs> awkward to find, but it's all in-game. I need to at some point track down the episode Oracle anime to find out if watching the anime and skipping all the cutscenes in-game is actually a viable option. <laughs> Pizza said she's watching through it and it's good, but, like, 
that it doesn't kind of, uh, I don't know. Like, I get the impression that it doesn't sync up exactly. I mean, different mediums have different needs for storytelling. So that would make some amount of sense. I, I'm not surprised because, like, I, I know the Final Fantasy V anime is not super, I don't know, like, it's a sequel. I didn't realize there was a Final Fantasy V anime. It's a pseudo sequel to Final Fantasy V. That's a weird place to tell a story, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't connect real well. Is 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 everyone alive? The main characters of FF5 do not appear. That's a decision that was made. I mean, and you're playing as Bart's son, I believe. Or Butt's son. Whichever <sighs> version of the name you want to call it. Not you're playing, but you're that's who the protagonist is. Interesting. I'm not sure what story you would be looking to tell there. I, like, I don't know what threads they feel it would still be left open. Is it any good? It has been a really long time since I watched it. I was mostly just confused because I'd never played five at that point. <laughs> Some people are going to tell you that it's great. Yeah. References back to it are not uncommon. Um, they even went with it for the Japanese translation for the Gunbreakers abilities. I have references to this anime. What? Wow. It is most definitely a thing that exists. It's really short, too. Is it just like a 25 or 26 episode. No, it's... I mean, I guess it's, what, basically one season? Half a season? I got 25 episodes, so... Oh, wow. That's like two seasons. Yep. Okay, so this next topic, I think we can at least talk a little bit about. Um, Folks have been back playing Guild Wars 2. Yeah, we... So I have some disagreements with... Arena Net leadership, to say the least, and said leadership is no longer there. So I've made a re- so I've decided to take a look at what's come out because Guild Wars Two. Um, since we were talking about story games with story and <laughs> the telling thereof, Guild Wars Two has gone from some pretty terrible storytelling. Like that learned something about storytelling. Yes. Well, and the thing is, is that I actually don't think that the, it's interesting, I don't, I don't think that the storytelling in Guild Wars 2 has ever been bad. I do. I will absolutely say the storytelling has been bad. The entirety <laughs> of the Destiny's Edge stuff was told in the dungeons. Okay. I was thinking of like the main story arc. Which intersects with that. You have no idea who these people are or why they're working together in the level 80 story as a result. Well, that's fair. I don't know. I I found that those I found that most of it was it was less the storytelling and more the actual story being told. Um because I think that the I think that the personal story whatever they call the first chapter, yeah, my story is not great. Those are of variable quality. Some of them are pretty good. Some of them are pretty most good. Most of them are pretty not. Yeah, that. And they have characters who are awful. Like there are there are almost no characters, there are no main characters and a handful of side characters who are worth noting. Um, Queen Jenna is great. I'm trying to think of anybody else who is good in that first. Section. Queen Jenna is great. The Imperators in uh, or the Tribunes that are not Ritlock are pretty great. Okay, that's fair. I was gonna say I had uh, I did not hate that, but. I feel like the plant elf was the least awful member of that group. It's kind of true until she backstabs you later. Kate is the most reasonable member of Destiny's Edge. Huh. Did you know that select missions from Living World Season 1 can now be replayed? I didn't. Uh, it makes me think that they recreated them. <laughs> update from Arena. I was, looking at, I was looking through the story journal, and one of them is Scarlet's War, which is basically Living World Season 1. And that's... Honestly, that is the that is the biggest like miss biggest. Yes, it is. The biggest miss is that right around the point where they made their story good. They also made it non repeatable events. Yeah, they made it non repeatable events. Um, I definitely they introduce but they introduce cool new characters. They Um, basically build a a entirely new group. Yeah, they build the previous group was not salvageable. Yeah, they they build an entirely new group. 
I think every member of that new group is a worthy inclusion. Um, because My dislike towards Bram aside, that is a thing, a statement I will agree with. Because because the thing is, is that in the context of a group that's where every character is interesting, the annoying hothead character is a worthy is like a nice inclusion because it's not every character. <laughs> um, to recap, the annoying hotheads in Destiny's Edge are all of them: Locke, Logan, Air, and Zoja. Everyone. Well, I mean, uh, Zoja's a, a a hothead, but also hyper condescending to everyone. Yeah. Well, so Zoja was not a salvageable character. They're yeah. They they um. I understand. I was talking to Ash about this uh like a week ago. But I understand how you get to those characters. I understand how you, as a team of writers, get to those characters. Because what you do is you say, the player character is the most important character. No, they should. We've been paying attention to World of Warcraft. We do not want to have our developer characters uh, consistently upstaging the player which wow does constantly to the point where the player is like almost a non-entity in wow but unfortunately they took it too far and all of the characters are incompetent and so you're rolling around with a bunch of incompetent characters who you who are like actively annoying to deal with because they don't have any redeeming qualities um and then they introduced all the new ones in Living World Season 1. And they're good... Because he started playing after that. Right, which we've never saw. But they're good enough that you can pick up the story in Living World Season 2 when you kind of know who these characters are supposed to be. And they're they're good. They're compelling. And it makes for a kind of awkward start. But, like... But it's really, really cool to see... To, like, play through Guild Wars 2 especially once they stop putting stuff in dungeons like their storytelling their storytelling has improved but their story has also improved to the point where like guild wars 2 probably has the second best storytelling of any mmo i've played and quite a few games i've played it's quite good like heart of thorns was good path of fire was great like they tell some really cool there's some really cool story going on I feel like in season two, they were still figuring some things out. But by the time they got to Heart of Thorns, they had it, had it down. Yes. And by the time they get to Path of Fire, they are, they've hit their stride and are refining it. And I think that they're, I think that they've, they've hit that. Like there's interesting stuff going on in all of the stories. I'm interested in where they're going with them. They have a, they have a meta plot that I care about. They've redeemed what characters they can. (laughs) Like I'm interested in most of the the like subplot characters. They're good at introducing temporary characters who are who are good who are like this is a local character who is good for this expansion and you can comfortably be like this person can go away and I'm not gonna be sad if we never see them again after this expansion. Which admittedly is what Guild Wars One did up until the point of uh whatever the, the I, north expansion I have north yeah because each of those realms was basically a insulated story all by itself yeah you shouldn't expect to run into cormier if you're in the faction storyline for instance yeah like cormier well and what i think what i think is worth what i also think is interesting is there um when they are telling particular kinds of stories they don't feel throwaway like I feel like they are good at interweaving stories and then also tying them into the spaces I'm playing in. Like it's not it's not either or. And I think they do a better job of telling story through gameplay than any other MMO. Like the actual dedicated story missions are great. That's good. They start like in the in the original story, they're like kind of iffy because they were still figuring out their mechanics and so like even their big set piece battles are like kind of janky but like I mean, their biggest set piece battle is in a dungeon using all of the horrible mechanics involved thereof yes 
And so, but like once they refine the like core gameplay loop and get rid of and like cut out all the stuff that it didn't need, because like Guild Wars 2 does not need dungeons. They figured out a better system. And I think it is a better system. I think it's legitimately a better system. I think fract I think fractals are super clever. Fractals are still kind of dungeony though, right? They are Yes, but they are mini and they aren't trying to tell a story in the context of oh, yeah. encounters. Yeah. That said, if I could talk you guys into running dungeons, just to lean one of them for my legendary. I was gonna say, I remember that the dungeons were a lot better than the The way first dungeon they were. I'm not even going to say the first dungeon. I'm going to say even that first dungeon was better when we came back to it. When we came back to it, we did the explorable path, which is not a thing we had ever done when we were originally playing this game. Yeah. I thought we did the real path. Nope. I haven't done that since I played the game the first time. Huh. Because we mostly didn't hit max level. You could do explorable starting at like level 35, but it was said to be hard, and we found the dungeon to be a miserable experience and stopped, basically stopped playing that game. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I always joke. I logged in to my character like four years later and it was right outside of Ascalon Ruins. Yep. And I think that time and a better understanding of what the game is actually is has helped its group content. Because I at one point I would absolutely have said that Guild Wars 2 has complete garbage group content. And I think that it did for a while. But I also feel like what's what it has now is actually pretty compelling group content. It just doesn't look like other MMO group content. Like it took them a while, but they did succeed at we we are not a Trinity game, except apparently in their raid content where they go back to it. Yeah, but they've also stopped producing raid content, which people who raid are complaining about. Meh. It's a real small community in that game. It it is. That's why you don't. Yeah, and they are they are much more invested in making content that the majority of their players play and then making that content feel epic and big and awesome. And honestly, they're pretty good at it. Like, big world events are cool. Especially, like, starting with Heart of Thorns, those world events are amazing. Like the ones that you would get in a train with? Right, exactly. Like the huge zone-wide take an hour and a half, maybe, to to get to fruition type events, it felt like this a has ten scale stages. Rage. I mean, yeah, Arc basically like is definitely rage. the best of those as far as Guild Wars Two goes. I but like they're all. Have you well, done Dragon's okay. Stand? I haven't done Dragon's Stand. Dragon's Stand is better. Fair enough. Like, the the one in Tangled Depths is also very good. Yeah, it's just that the first one you get exposed to is less good. The first one you get exposed to is frustrating and not good, but like. Everyone after that is great. Um, Although it's a little weird that they basically took MOBA mechanics and were like, hey, you know what would be great? Let's make this zone into a MOBA map. So I I honestly I honestly feel like Dragon Stand in Guild Wars 2 is better than the majority of raid experiences I have had. If you want to talk about large group coordinated events, like large group coordinated play, I think that the Dragon Stand zone event is better than the majority of uh, of similar stuff. Like, and I've I've done a lot of raiding, but it it captures what it's trying to do, and it feels like just epic and awesome. And I need to do some of the new ones in Path of Fire because there's a bunch of new events and I haven't really done them, but I bet they're I bet they're similarly great. But also comment that I'm surprised. I'm surprised that I'm finding myself logging into Guild Wars 2 for the story. Because that's a new experience for me. Things can change. Yep. I mean, it's good that you have one MMO that you're logging into this for the story. <laughs> I need to catch up on Final Fantasy 14, but yes, yeah. you do. There's some stuff. There's yes. some stuff. Yeah. That 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 you know I would like to talk about. I know Thalen would like to talk about and probably Emma would like to talk about yes. as well. Yes. Very much so. So some okay. stuff is happening. Yeah. So maybe catch up on the story, because yeah. I just wish it were as fun to catch up on the FF fourteen story as it is to catch up on the Guild Wars two story. <laughs> the FF fourteen story is definitely better. No doubt about that. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't really miss I mean I don't know. There's some stuff I really like about the play of 
uh, Final Fantasy fourteen. Absolutely. No, no, no. I totally agree. It's just not the play through the story parts. Like, catching up on lots and lots of cutscenes without a lot of gameplay doesn't do it for me a lot of the time. But it is on my list to catch up on. Well, I guess on that note, um, there are any final thoughts that we have on anything that we've talked about tonight? Sounds like no. Okay. Well, hopefully you enjoyed the show, and we will see you again next week. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you.